love that song. Every time I hear that song, I think about how I would love to hear each one of your stories. How I'd love to hear how the grace of God has touched your lives and, and to hear your testimony. But that's a different day. Uh, this morning, the sixth chapter of the book of Mark, we'll begin reading in the 34th verse. We're not going to read it yet. We've been preaching a series on leadership, and I won't go through them much, but we realized that David was the apple of God's eye a couple of weeks ago. But throughout his time with God, he became very selfish and only thought of himself. And it, it didn't render very well with Bathsheba, and it didn't render very well with his kingdom. Last week, we looked at Elijah, how that one minute Elijah had power with God. That on his prayer, as his breath came out of his body, that fire come down from heaven and licked up the sacrifice, licked up the altar, took every drop of water, the dirt, and everything with it. That's power with God. And then four verses later, he's running from his life because somebody threatened to kill him. Leadership is difficult. This morning we're going to look at the greatest leader of all time, and no, not Nick Saban. Uh, Nick Saban had a great quote, and I will probably slaughter it, but Nick Saban says, if you're going to become a leader that everyone likes, give away ice cream. Other than that, you will be hated by some. So anyway, in the sixth chapter of Mark, we find Jesus going to a village, and in that village, He began to heal people in that village, and His disciples were with Him. And so Jesus healed people in that village. They, they brought them to Him. And so Jesus left. Jesus and the disciples left that village and went to another village. And when the people of this village heard that Jesus was coming, they tried to estimate, guesstimate, which path He would take. And so imagine the people taking the beds or whatever it was and taking it over to 3rd Street and they saw Jesus coming down 3rd Street, and all of a sudden Jesus turns and goes across Elm. And so they all pick them up and told them to Elm because they're, they're praying. They've watched their loved ones suffer for so long that they're praying that God, that Jesus might touch them and heal them. Meanwhile, Jesus sent His disciples away, and, and they were away at, while they were at the second village, and the disciples came back to where Jesus was and the disciples were telling Jesus exactly what all they had done in His name. The, the conversations they had had in His name. The ministry that they had done in His name. And Jesus had compassion. He, he had compassion on His disciples because they had neither eat nor slept. They were exhausted. And so Jesus said this. He said, you get in the boat and we're going to go yonder to a deserted place. And he said, when we get there, he said, we will eat, you will rest, and everything will be well. So the disciples got in the boat, and Jesus got in the boat, and they went across the water. But the people of the last village saw him. As a matter of fact, the people from all the villages saw him and knew who he was. And so they ran, ran to where Jesus was going. So that when Jesus got to where He was going, His main concern was feeding His disciples and letting them rest. And this is where we pick up. And the very first Scripture is a Scripture I want you to underline in your Bible. For me, this is beside John 3.16. For me, this Scripture is beside the Great Commission. Jesus told us, He said, go out into all the world preaching and teaching in My name and baptizing them in My name. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We find that we live in that day. Oh, y'all are scrambling trying to read it. We live in the Great Commission day, but there's something we must have. I have it, but I have to learn that I need more of it. So Jesus is getting out of the boat. His concern was the disciples. His concern was feeding them. His concern was letting them rest. 
And it said, And Jesus, when He came out of the boat, He saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So He began to teach them many things. We will come back to that Scripture. And when the day was far, now far spent, His disciples came to Him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away, that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But He, said unto, he answered and said unto them, You give them something to eat. And they said unto Him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? And He said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then He commanded them to make them all set down in groups on the green grass. And so they sat down in ranks in hundreds and in fifties. And when He had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and He blessed and broke the loaves and He gave them to His disciples to set them before them and the two fish He divided among them all. And so they all ate and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of fragments and the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about five thousand men. Notice they didn't count women and children back then. There may have been 10, there may have been 12,000 people. We start with the very first verse, and guys, I, I don't like breaking down Scripture, but there's no other way to see the full picture of this without us breaking it down. If he wants to put it on the screen, that's fine. I thought to myself that all through my ministry, since I've been a Christian, and especially since I've been a pastor, a preacher, we have a lot of things that encumber our minds. This morning, each one of you have looked around and went, wow, we're slim this morning. That's a big concern on our minds. How many are sitting in the pews? We don't know how many are watching online, but that's a big concern. Usually the second concern is, I wonder what our offering will be. Especially pastoring a small church, you have bills to pay, so you start worrying about how the offering is. At the end of the service, during the service, if the choir doesn't hit just right, or if the words don't hit just right on the screen, or maybe they're a little different, it, it bothers you. And at the end of the day, you evaluate yourself on the message that was preached, how well the congregation accepted it, and then you start the next week looking for places to do ministry, and you start thinking about the next service. I thought Jesus was doing one the, the very same thing, he was doing the ministry that God had sent him to do in both of these villages. And then he turned his eyes upon something that needed to be taken care of. He turned his eyes on the disciples. He turned his eyes on the one that would begin the new church not long after. And he saw that they were tired. He saw that they were hungry. He saw that they were spent. So Jesus said, well, I will leave this group and I will go take care of this group. And so as they went, the people ran to where He was going. You see, maybe not all the healing was finished yet. Maybe the healing of the sick was finished. But maybe some of them had some heartbroken issues. Maybe some of them needed more time. The ones that toted the beds and rolled the wheelchairs and done all of that kind of, done the nursing and, and all of that. Maybe they had seen these people crippled up, one's healed. But maybe they needed Jesus too. Maybe they had a need in their life, and so the Bible says that they ran to where He was going. Ran to where Jesus was going. Jesus' mind was on the disciples. They're going to be the church. We've got to take care of them. We've got to feed them. We've got to let them have some rest. We've got to have some understanding that they've been out doing ministry and they're tired. And so Jesus, with His whole mind, set on the disciples when they got to where they were going to the barren place. Jesus rose up. Guys, I love this Scripture. And He saw a great multitude. 
so many times in my ministry, I keep my eyes on the church so strong. I keep my eyes on how many are sitting in the pews and how much our offering is and whether we hit the notes just perfect and how bad my grammar was for that Sunday. I keep my notes, I keep my eyes on the disciples. The Scripture has changed my heart because the church is what it is and I'll do the best we can for the church. But guys, if we ever take our eyes off the multitude, <laughs> Jesus, doing God's work, come out of the boat. And He looked at the multitude and was moved with compassion for them. He looked at the drug addicts. He looked at the mother that was raising three kids. The kids are all healed now. He looked at the father. Sometimes worse. I think mothers are better equipped sometimes to take care of the kids, but there are fathers that are raising kids on their own. He looked at the one that had lost his spouse. He looked at the one that had just buried his parents. He looked at the ones... Though not the sick ones, but the rest of them that were busy doing ministry, the ones that ran. And the Bible says He looked on them and He had compassion on them. He said, because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. In other words, they were just going to and fro trying to find something to bring peace in their life. Sometimes we take our eyes off of the drug addict. And we say, well, you know, they're, they're kind of getting what they deserved. But what we don't realize, there was a brokenness that got them to that place to start with. That's why they're trying to fix themselves. We look at the alcoholic. We look at the habitual liar. We look at the ladies of the night, the men of the night, the ones that are addicted to porn. We look at the ones that are good people, but they're not coming to church. We look at all of these sometimes and we don't realize... That they're like sheep without a shepherd. Nobody wants to do evil. Nobody does. Nobody wants to be separated from God. Nobody. But yet Jesus looked at the crowd and He had compassion on them. And He sat down and done the last thing that we want to do. He talked to them. He taught them. He gave them Something that was more than feeding the 5,000. He gave them something more important. You see, in John, He said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus looked down at these sheep without a shepherd, these lost individuals, these broken individuals, and the Bible said that He left His disciples to tend for themselves, and He went down to where the people are, and He gathered around, and He began to teach them. Thus saith the Word. So many times in my office, people will come in and I, I get the sad story about their power bill or, or COVID or they miss work. And the first thing that comes to my mind, well, let's get that power bill. Let's get that water bill paid. Let's get you a gas voucher or a meal voucher. And, and for so long, for the first year and a half in the missions office, I was so concerned about paying a power bill. That's why they walked in the door. I was so concerned about paying their water bill. That's why they're here. Jesus did not, He didn't care or first about their power bill. He cared about giving them the Word. So now when you walk into my office with a need, one of the questions that I'm going to ask you is, where you go to church? What family are you a part of? Are you raising your kids in the admonition of the Lord? When's the last time you prayed? Does God know who you are? Do you know who He is? I don't fix their problem. I fix their problem. We have conversations. Had a lady call this week. Had three children by three different last names. 
She said, I know my kid. I didn't say that. She said that. She said, I know my kids all have three different last names. I said, ma'am, I didn't, I'm not here to judge you. And I said, I don't know whether you believe in the Lord or not. She said, I was raised in church. And I said, how long has it been since you've been to church? She said, since I was a child. I said, how long has it been since you got down on your hands and knees and said, God, here am I? She said, I don't remember. You see, she needed her rent paid because she was going to be evicted that day. But she's going to be on the verge of eviction next month. But to give her the Word is the greatest thing. To not look at different names in children, maybe even different races of children or mixed races of children. God looked at them and He had compassion on them. He said, but the reason they're wandering around like that, He said they have no shepherd. We judge people by the decisions that they made, by how many decisions, good decisions can you make if you don't have someone leading you and teaching you and showing you the right way. Jesus went further. The disciples, His main guys, His best friends, if you would, the ones He was training for leadership, they come to Him. Now listen to how much of the vision they had got. Ready? They said, Lord, send these people away. Send them away where they can take care of themselves. The day is long. The sun's about to go down. Listen, Lord, they, 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 these people, these people need to go take care of themselves. In other words, Jesus had seen them that they were like sheep without a shepherd, but the disciples had not seen them that way. They saw them as a burden. They need to go take care of themselves. In the 37th verse, He answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. Do you notice that Jesus could have fed them right there? But instead of Him doing it, He's trying to get the disciples to get the vision that He's got. And Jesus said, You feed them. You wrestle with how. Because when Jesus asked that question, Instead of getting them to the preacher, the preacher says, you tell them about the Word. And the disciples said, oh, if, we, if, we, if we had, we had 10,000 a day, we, we, Lord, we, we can't, we, I, I just can't. We can't do that. Go to the next verse. I'll read it with y'all. But Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. Church, you're fixing to hate these next few sentences. Jesus asked them to do something that was absolutely impossible for them to do. Jesus knew that the disciples did not have the faith. He knew they did not have the power with God. He knew that they could not just speak out of the air and feed five, ten, fifteen thousand 15,000 people. He knew that when He said, you feed them. But what He said next is so beautiful. He said, how many loaves do you have? Go see. Let me interpret that in 2021. Okay, so you can't feed 5,000 or 10,000? He said, how many can you feed? What have you got? I'm not a preacher. He said, Jesus is basically saying, I know you would. I knew you weren't a preacher the first time we talked. He said, but what do you have? What do you have? Do you have a testimony? Do you have a story? Go see. Go see. Go see what you can give them. They come back. And they said, Lord, we, 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 I don't have much. If I ask you about your Christian whatever, tackle box, shelf of armor, whatever, and I ask you, have you got enough to save the world? You would say, no, I, I don't. And then Jesus would say, do you have enough to save one? Tell me what you do have. He said, go see. And so they brought it back, five loaves and two little fishes. And then He commanded them, look at this, He commanded them to make them, who's He talking to? 
He's not talking to the 5,000. Because see, the 5,000 are without a shepherd. They have no direction. And Jesus is trying His best. Go back to 34. I'm going to wear Him out today. Get my money's worth out of Him. Jesus is trying His best to get them to see the vision that He had. And Jesus, when He came out, He saw the great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. He's trying to get the disciples, not just Jesus to feed them, because if Jesus feeds them, then the disciples are just as lost as they were before. They're just totally dependent upon Jesus. And Jesus said, if you go and you find somebody hungry, and you say, well, be filled in the name of Jesus Christ, He said, does that fill their belly? He said, no, it doesn't. So He's asking the disciples to get the vision of the people. He's asking the church to get the vision of the multitude. And He's asking them to have the compassion on them that Jesus has. So He tells them to make them. So instead of Jesus being the main leader, He tells them He's training up leaders. So He said, you go tell them to sit down. And so the disciples walks out to the multitude and says, Okay, I need y'all to sit down in a hundred here. I need a fifty over here. I need fifty. I need a hundred. So he tells them to sit. So they're no longer looking at Jesus. They're looking at the people that's speaking to them, which are the ones that still didn't have compassion on them. And so he set them down in ranks in hundreds and fifties. And when Jesus had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and he blessed it and he broke the loaves and he gave them to who? You. And me. Jesus didn't feed anybody. He had it blessed by the Father and He gave it to the disciples to feed them. Because He wanted the multitude not necessarily to look at Him because where's Jesus at right now? Y'all see Him? He's not here. So He wanted them to know that these are the representatives of Christ, the church that is going to be. And He wanted the people to no longer walk around without a shepherd. He wanted them to look to the church for guidance, for leadership. And so He broke the bloves, He blessed the fish, and He gave it to them, and they took the fish, and the disciples are the ones that divided it among the people. So in the result, God was included with the blessing. The Son is the one that received the blessing. And He taught, tried to teach the disciples to see the multitude where they are. And in the result, they all ate. And they all were filled. Go to the next verse. And they took up the twelve baskets full of fragments and of fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. I thought this morning that church, sometimes I get my priorities out of line as a leader of the church. This Scripture, the 34th verse, and I want you to go home and talk about it with your spouses. Talk about it with your kids or friends on the phone. I get my priorities out of line. I do, not you, I do. Because so many times I get my mind fixed on Monday morning. I had to make a note of, of what of something I have to do Monday morning. We sent off the shoe boxes, but I didn't do a, a, a PO to do the check for the shipping. You see, I got so carried away with how many shoe boxes that we did, 206. Some gripe because we used to do 400. Well, there's a lot we used to do. We can't do anymore or we, we're not in a position to do anymore. But I got so caught up in getting that 200, I lost complete sight of the children that was going to open them. I didn't even pray over them when I delivered them. Because my mission was not the children. 
My mission was not the multitude. And it wasn't because of compassion. I got so carried away, I wanted to make a good show. And I want to get 200. That'll make the church feel good. That'll make me feel good. That'll be awesome. We'll even tell everybody in the district, I bet we got more shoe boxes than the district. And God looks at me and says, God forbid. This is my confession. I told you at the beginning that this verse changed me. Church, we may, this is the most giving church I've ever been a part of. I, I mean, above and beyond. But we can never lose sight of the multitude. We can never get so caught up in their sin or their situation unless we realize they're just sheep without shepherds. They're no different than we were. They were no different than I was before I found Christ. I was, I was trash. I was, egotistical, I was a horrible, horrible person. But to have the vision of Christ means He didn't look at who I was, He looked at who I could be. (laughs) So I thought this morning, sometimes the reason I have such a hard time doing the Great Commission of going out into the highways and the byways Teaching and preaching and baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son. It's because I sometimes lose sight of the vision of the people. I know that doesn't happen to y'all, but it does happen to me. Sometimes I get caught up in the doing that I forget the why. I thought this morning that church, I got some time. You start to see a glimpse of it. This very same chapter, Jesus comes walking on the water to where the disciples are sitting in a boat. And they were scared to death. They thought it was a ghost. And they cried out from fear. Jesus said, don't be afraid. It is I. One of them starts to get it. One starts to get it. And it was Peter. Hang with me. I'm getting long-winded, but you've got to hear this. I still got 15 minutes, guys. Peter looked at Jesus and he said this, Lord, if that's you, I want to come to where you're at. <laughs> Wonder what the other 11 were thinking. If you'll keep your mouth shut, sit down, Jesus will come where we're at. Because you see, Peter had started to get a small glimpse of the real Gospel. If we remain in the boat where we are, we will never see, nor will the multitude ever experience what it is to be in the presence of God. Peter realized that in the boat, the winds rocked it. In the boat, they were okay. Their bellies were filled. Everything was okay. Peter realized that there was no miracles going to happen in the boat. There was no magnificent immaculation was not going to happen as long as he stayed in the boat. He realized that he would never feed 5,000 people as long as he stayed in the boat. And so Jesus looked out and he realized he got a touch of the glimpse about having compassion on the people and realizing and he wanted not to be where the other disciples wanted to be he wanted to be where Jesus was because you see where Jesus is is where dead folks raise up see some of you think that's silly but I'm I'm just telling you the gospel where Jesus is is where withered hands get healed. Where Jesus is, is where 5,000 get fed, or 10,000. Where Jesus is, the glory of God will shine down on it, and people will be able to see the works and the awesomeness of God. Peter said, Lord, if that's you, I want to come Lord, I'm tired of waiting for you to come to where I am. Hello? I want to come where you are. 
Lord, I want to come where miracles are not impossible, but possible. I want to come where a great revival can happen. I want to come, Lord, where anything is possible. I want to come to where my eyes will be on the multitude, not just on myself. And the one sitting in the boat said, you idiot. You need to sit down and shut up. Jesus And Peter said, no. I want to be like him. And the Bible said that Peter got out of the boat and began to walk on the water. If you'll go over to Acts, and I think I told you this last week, Peter, kind of like Elijah, got selfish again. And when they asked him, aren't you the one that was used to walk? He said, no, it wasn't me. Mm -mm. He was saving his own life. Y'all, you've never seen anybody bludgeoned to death like they bludgeoned Jesus. You would have denied it too. And so would I. But in Acts, Peter started getting the fuller vision. <laughs> Peter stood up and he said, Men and brethren, it is this same Jesus who you crucified. See my toes bouncing. I want you to know this morning that God's trying to raise up leaders. He's trying to show us to keep our eyes on the lost. He's trying to show us doing the work of the church is awesome, it's great, and it, it is part of it. Lord knows we need to count the numbers that are here. That's, that's part of it. We need to count the offering. That's part of it. If we don't have enough money to continue, then we'll have to close the doors. It's part of it. But He said the main thing that we've got to do is see the people. Have compassion on them. And sit down and give them the word. If we're not, if they're not coming here, we may have to walk on water to go to where Jesus is. I thought this morning that sharing that vision with one another, I'm gonna say one more thing, and then y'all get a verse of song. It's still ten till. I wish I could go back and raise my kids over again. Because when I would show them how to do something, I didn't have very much like changing the oil. I remember my kids crawling on the truck with me, my boys. And I remember saying, this is what you got to do. Take that wrench, it's a 5 eighths. take it, put it up here like this. No, oh my gosh, you got to have the bucket underneath it, you got to have the pan underneath it. Now there's oil all... I wish, I wish I could go back and do what Jesus did. How do you think you would change the law? Instead of being all-knowing, waiting for them to mess up to where I could make them look bad, and I did, if I would have asked them how to change the law, the first thing they would have done is got on YouTube and watched somebody else do it. But see, I didn't empower them the way Jesus did. It was more about me looking smart, me being correct, me being awesome. Because they all had iPhones. They could have went on YouTube and watched somebody change the oil, and they would have been powered and confident to come out and done it themselves. So this morning, I want to encourage you to pray. If you still keep the vision of God, you kill, keep the vision of people, praise God for you. But sometimes I get caught up in the work and lose it. Jesus said this, and I'll hush, I promise. To love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all that you are. And He said the second one, is pretty much just like the first one. To love our neighbor as ourself. Stand with us.
this time, we'll take up our offering in the back and in the front as you dismiss. We will have our doxology, and then I will dismiss us with prayer. Father, Lord, we lift up our plate. One of the few places that we can give back to you. So, Father, Lord, we ask that you bless our offering. Bless those that have it to give and those that have nothing to give. But never, ever let it be all we give to you. Father, we give our all ourselves. Father, bless our offering. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. If you're under conviction this morning for not loving our neighbor, let it go. You can't change yesterday. No matter how hard you try, change who you are. Don't hear the condemnation of the message, but hear the joy. Do you know that it's God's intentions for you to walk on water? Did you know that it's God's intentions for us to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ? Did you know that if the world that is lost is ever going to get saved, that the same power that was in Elijah has been given up to us? Don't do church. I pray that you leave here this morning and be the church. Be Jesus Christ incarnate in the world that some might be saved. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank You. I think every one of us have got comfortable in the boat from time to time, and we probably will again. But thank You, Father, reminding us we're not just Christians, but we are the sons and daughters of God. We have not because we've asked not. We hadn't walked on water because, I'll be honest with you, this boat feels pretty good sometimes. Father, I pray that You call, I pray for fire to come down from heaven to ignite our church, even in the midst of COVID. That we may see the people, have compassion on them, and love them right where they are. Go with us in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Church, you are dismissed.